Good evening and welcome to tonight's segment of Equity at Work being brought to you by Associated Black Charities. My name is Chrissy Thornton and I'm so excited to welcome each of you to tonight's webinar programming. ABC is a racial equity organization and its impact over the years has been built on our belief that confronting the effects of structural racism can be transformational in the lives of Black people. And so this Equity at Work webinar series explores the lived experiences of navigating the workplace while Black. By addressing common issues and obstacles affecting the Black worker, ABC aims to create awareness and also provide tools and resources to help professionals and workers navigate barriers successfully. So tonight I am so happy to be here to discuss redefining professionalism. And at this time, I would like to invite our panelists, our STEAM panelists for this evening to join me on screen. While they're coming forward, we'll just review our topic and objectives for tonight. For Black workers, navigating the concept of professionalism in the workplace can often be a delicate balancing act. Cultural identity, unique communication styles, and diverse experiences present both opportunities and challenges. Black professionals may, in, may actually face implicit biases or misconceptions surrounding their professionalism. The burden of disproving stereotypes and disproportionate scrutiny can also be very draining. However, we know that with resilience and strategic navigation, Black professionals can assert their authenticity while succeeding in their careers. We believe that a more inclusive approach to professionalism means dismantling systemic biases and addressing barriers that hinder equitable opportunities for Black professionals to thrive. And this evening, we have some very esteemed panelists with me, and I can't wait for you all to meet and hear from them as well. I will note this tonight I've been looking forward to because I believe there will be so many learning and development and growth opportunities for me as we have this discussion. And so at this time, I'd like um, to invite each of you to not only introduce yourself to our uh, audience tonight, but also to tell us why this conversation around professionalism is so important today. And we'll start with you, Delegate Smith. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Thank you to your entire team at ABC for putting this on. And this is a conversation that honestly, it needs to be had on an ongoing basis because I think that um, for me, you know, as a delegate, as an elected official, I, I work at the consent of the public. I had to get people comfortable with what my version of being a professional, a public professional meant at the voting box. But I also have a day job like many other people in Maryland, and I work in a space that is still struggling to um, get more diversity in the pipeline. I work in the urban affairs um, space, particularly urban planning, urban and regional planning. And um, in a past life, I've worked um, in other government and nonprofit spaces. And so the part of the conversation I would like to unpack and discuss with my um, colleagues here is when you're working at a mission-based organization or you're working for the government, the notion is I'm a good person. I'm foregoing um, a larger salary and some other creature comforts because I'm helping to um, implement a vision. And I think when folks are in those spaces where the bottom line isn't as express as profits, there can be even more, I think, tension around what does it mean to be sensitive around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, because they feel their goodness is on trial when really we're having a conversation about cultural competency being a form of professional competency. So I try to turn the conversation of professionalism back to if you're not culturally competent, then you are not professionally competent. And I think oftentimes um, notions of professionalism as they pertain to Black workers tend to center around grooming um, style and those other types of aesthetics. But if we want to get to the nuts and bolts of being an effective executive worker, entry level, all the way to to the CEO, cultural competency is just as important as knowing the Microsoft suite of, you know, of other materials. And so I think, um, I hope that, you know, under your leadership and that of, of many people, I think in the Baltimore space, we can move that conversation forward. Thank you so much. Michael? So, um, Actually, thank you um, again, Chrissy and team for, for the invite to be a part of this. And um, uh, uh, Delegate Smith, you just hit it. Um, and in the sense that um, one of the things you, you, you first said, which got me to think was, we're always growing, we're changing, things are changing, right? 
Um, and it's important for us to be um, having these conversations ongoing because things are changing, right? Um, and it's not the good old quote days, right, that we talk about or that folks talk about. And I always remind folks, the good old days ain't, wasn't always the good old days for everybody. And so what does that mean for us to really think about, okay, and back in the day we did this, well, was that really meeting the needs of the individuals that um, we are talking about, right? Um, and oftentimes the answer will be no. Um, and in and, um, and this space, this conversation allows us to think about, okay, what is prof professionalism? And I come to it um, looking at mentorship, right? We learn professionalism like, like from our mentors, typically, especially in the area. And so as you were talking about being culturally competent, um, I'm also thinking of that in terms of mentorship, right? How are you mentoring folks, right? Um, how are you supporting them? And so I myself have created a, a frame of mentoring called holistic critical mentoring. We'll talk about that a little later in the conversation, but I, 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 I created it because I was recognizing that um, the toxic uh, uh, behaviors of past mentors, I was also doing to my students. Right, like I was continuing that process when even I knew it was toxic, but this is what I learned professionalism is, right? This is what I learned mentoring is to be, right? And so I had to do some soul searching. And this background that I have, this mental white supremacy is actually, I, I, I tell folks, it's, it's not a sign for y'all, it's a sign for me, it's a mirror. I look at it, right? Every time I see it, I'm, I'm looking at it now. Everything that I do, every time I engage with my students, every time I'm in conversation with folks, I gotta ask myself, am I holding right um, forth a racist, and even if it's un unintentional, right? How I am performing and, and supporting my students, am I holding on to these um, old idealistic ways instead of really meeting their needs, right? And so that's how I enter this conversation. Thank you so much. And Lee. Wow, first of all, again, yes echoing the sentiments of both uh, Delegate Smith and Michael. I, it is an honor and a pleasure, privilege to be here with you, Chrissy, and the APC team. Um, my name is Lee Gibbs. I am the Creative and Performing Arts Officer for Prince George's County Public Schools. I am also a freelance photographer. I have my business, been in business now for about 10 years. And um, I'm a father and I'm a church boy at the end of the day. Um, to Michael's point, I think, I joined the conversation about professionalism from multiple aspects. Number one, thinking about my learned experiences, my lived experiences, right? The mentors, the people who I grew up with or who I grew up under really fashioned me or you know, kind of contributed to my outlook on how or what professionalism is. But then I also, as I got older and started to really question some of the, some of the, the traditional thoughts that we've had both in church and in business, um, as an educator, I always talk about what are the tools of measurement, right? Um, professionalism, where does that actually, like who defined professionalism? And I really am excited about this conversation because I feel that unfortunately, compliance is really what we're looking for more so than professionalism. And so do what I say, dress this particular way, that's what makes you good. That's what makes you successful. That's what makes you efficient in your job versus actually being good at your job, right? So we, we really, we, we, I like the idea of redefining professionalism at this point because I think right now it's more about compliance than anything else. So that's, that's why I'm very excited about this conversation. Well, thank you so much. And I too, I'm excited. And I must admit, and I've said this kind of in the pre-production, like I need to learn. I come from a generation that where, you know, a lot of the white constructs around professionalism were imparted to what we had to do, how we had to show up to be competitive. And so it's really a mindset development and a reframing of thinking that has to happen to depart from that. And I'll be honest in saying that I need, need some some of that um, as well. Um, but I want to start with a level setting of talking about the traditional notions around professionalism so that we can start to maybe challenge those. But traditional notions around professionalism are usually around appearance and dress, language, um, you know, respectful behavior, ethical conduct, um, showing emotional restraint. 
having boundaries and these kind of things that don't sound bad on their face. So what do you think about like these traditional notions around professionalism? And when we look at professionalism as defined by those standards, is it a bad thing to want to conform to those, some of those things? Stephanie? I want to start with some of those things don't seem outwardly objectionable, but if we're honest, how many times were they really applied evenly? Mm -hmm. Right? Certain people could get away with more colorful language without a write up or, you know, someone pulling them to, a, to the side. And I think um, when you cut, show up as a worker, but you're a woman, you show up as a worker, but a person of color, you show up as a worker or a member of the LGBTQ plus community, or you're at the intersection of several of those identities, sometimes that latitude is not extended to you <laughs> for um, certain behaviors that otherwise someone else, it could just be, well, he's just blown off some steam, right? <laughs> um, it, 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 was, it was a fraught conversation, whatever it is. So I think that if we want to be honest, though those things may seem benign when you just kind of itemize them that way, the experience of the enforcement around those norms has never been uniform. <laughs> um, and I don't mean just like they're cross sectors. I mean, within one office of like 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be uniform. And so I think we have to, um, I think, center conversations of professionalism around how do we show up to respect um, team members. So for example, if we're working in a team and I'm supposed to do something, and if I don't do something, someone else can't carry out their next part of the task, that is a form of disrespect if communication lines are open and you're not, you know, allowing people to know what's going on with you, right? But if I simply have um, another perspective that I would like the group to consider, I don't think that introduction of a different um, lens is itself a form of being unprofessional. But in some places, that simply is enough to be deemed unprofessional because it's to um, Lee's point earlier about compliance. I just had a thought earlier today that some people's version of leadership is more centered on controlling others than having any form of progress. So this can happen in a business set setting. It can happen in, in a variety of settings that are not necessarily on business. And so when you peel back the layers, is this rule, is this norm, does it further our success, whatever that is defined as by the entity? If the answer is no, then we sometimes have to wonder, is this about controlling others? Because control is a proxy for me feeling like I'm exercising leadership. Absolutely. Michael, any thoughts on traditional notions of professionalism? Ooh, child, let me tell you, let me tell you. Okay, so, cause what you just said, just I, I was just scribbling here, it, it's power, right, right? Who has the power? Power is a big part of this conversation. And so looking at, um, these traditional notions around it. Um, my question is, is not just about um, uh, um, uh, who is heard. Well, no, my, that's my question, is about who is actually being heard in this space, right? And so um, whose dress code are we adhering to? Whose language are we adhering to? Um, punctuality, that, that's about time, which is also a, a, an avenue of, 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 of white supremacist um, uh, uh, navigation, and that's another word I want to use, but um, th there's this sense there that um, each of these, if you look at your, the list, uh, re respectful behavior, who determines that respectful behavior, right? What is that? Like, and I think that the majority has had that voice, right? And that has been the voice that has centered um, these areas of professionalism. Now, if we think about it, I love how you talked about about the team, the community, right? Like the way in which I try to approach it is in that kind of way, right? And it takes each of these in a different light. But right now, the way we, we have it set up and the way in which we um, uh, move with this idea of professionalism is really centering one particular group's understanding of the concept. And that's the part that like, I hope that we redefine, right? It's not about this idealistic aspect of professionalism because that's what we want like we know what that means right there's work to get done and we got to do it to figure do it and navigate together but um i think we have to have a meeting of the minds and as far as like what that means for me and what that means for you and how the power that that sense of that power control um that has to be relinquished and guess what white males 
white folks, black men, right, in spaces will not relinquish that power. And that's the conversation that we've got to talk about too. And then our very own other folks, our black sisters, right, our, our white sisters, all those other folks um, are still per perpetrating what the other folks are doing, right? Because that's all they know and all they see, right? And that's what they see as what's going to get us ahead. Absolutely. Lee, you have any thoughts before we move on? Wow, like, so in my introduction, I was just mentioning just this whole idea of who sets the definition. And I think both Delegate Smith and, and uh, Michael just really hit on that. You know, who has the power? Who is the one that determines what professionalism really looks like? Um, this idea of professionalism, I believe, especially from the Black community or from the Black church community, may have started with this idea of giving God your best. You know, so Sundays was the day you really turned it up. Like, you know, you put on, you know, you put on all the clothes. <laughs> That's you right. Put everything on, you know, <laughs> um, I am, you know, I'm a, I'm a proud born and raised Baptist boy from New Shallow Baptist Church, Baltimore, Maryland, right? Where my one person who I looked up to every Sunday through, through Saturday was Reverend Dr. Harold A. Carter Sr. That man dressed, he drove the best cars, you know, his jewelry was on point. Everything about him was great. And so I, I looked at that like, oh, he must be great. You know, he's a great man because look, at he, look what he's wearing, look what he's driving, look what he has on. But then taking a, even a more closer um, thought for me really started with just in my house. If you were going to church, you know, my grandmother's, you know, my grandmother was a stickler for make sure you had your time. Make sure, you know, if you, got, if you had belt loops, you got a belt. If you, you know, all of those things that, you know, you're taught early on. And then it kind of trickled into um, this, I, you know, into the professional realm, into, into the, the marketplace in that, you know, we still wanted to put our best foot forward because understanding that we already, there is a stigma against us. We always, you know, wanted to come in and present our best, whether we felt our best or not, which, you know, we become the masters of the mask, but that's a whole different conversation for a different day. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this, this idea of professionalism, unfortunately, in our homes, it was established because that's what they were told. I think somebody mentioned that earlier, you know, we, it was taught like, you know, you had to do this, you know, um, in all reverence to God, you know, you want to give them your best, but I don't think it ever was about the clothes or, you know, any of those things. And unfortunately we kind of pivoted, but I, you know what, I'm sitting here, Chrissy, like you, I am gleaning from all of these amazing thought partners and, you know, I'm gonna stop there because no, gonna, yeah, I'm it's a continual <laughs> learning process, and I think and we Chrissy, have, a, yeah, yeah, we have a lot to no, unpack. Can I just say something to, to Lee? Because you were, you, I thought you was gonna go go there when you were talking about Dr. Carter. Because Lee and I grew up together, so we were in the That's same right. church, New Shallow Baptist Church, on the Dr. Hurley Carter and Dr. Hurley Carter Jr. Right? We we were, we we were in that space, right? And um, something you had said where Dren wearing the best, and I, I think of your grandmother too, right? Like <laughs> you sort of mentioned that, but I think even for her there was this sense of even when she saw Carter and them saw him the best, she wanted the best for us, wanted the best yeah. for you, right? Yeah. And so because she saw that that was the best, there's this trickle down of that, that I want you to have that too. So I want you to show up in that best as well, right? And I think of my mom in that same kind of way, right? And I remember one of my rebellious times, I don't know, she's in the other room, so she, and she's listening, so I know she's probably uh, gonna uh, say something about this. But I uh, remember when I was at Shiloh and um, I was in my rebellious mood type thing because she wanted me to wear a suit and I didn't want to wear a suit. I wanted mm -hmm. to wear my jeans and what have you. And the reality is something I remember telling her was that the cost of my suit, we got that suit from the thrift store, right? And the jeans that I got, I was always a big guy. We went to the big and tall store and that's like $50, $60, $70 pair of jeans. Right. So you're telling me to bring my best is the suit when actually my best is the jeans. Right. Like, like, and, but it's because of what you, we were just talking about of what we've already set up, right. As to be what is the best 
right? And it's this white European setup. And I'm gonna stop there because Chrissy, I might be going into your next question. So no, so please. yeah, this leads us right into it because you know a lot of this is mindset development. Many of us learned in our homes and you know from the our, our networks and villages and people we saw to know how to conform. I mean, we live in a world where you're where you are absolutely taught to conform, and in many ways you're rewarded for it. And so I remember, I mean, there's a dread there was a dress code in school coming up. Um, there was dress codes in, in college. And this is not just about dress, but we're also talking about conduct, right? There are expectations set around how you show up. And so now we get to 2023, right? And there's this new resurgence of people wanting to be authentic. So is professionalism a racist construct or you know, is it not inherently racist, but more like Stephanie said about how it's applied, but is it okay to have standards of and expectations um, for certain environments or is that inherently racist the way that's set up? What do you think? I personally don't believe the absence of standards is somehow more culturally relevant to me as a black person. I believe I, I, I hail from people whether they, you know, began their, their stories on the shores of the United States or some other, you know, far off land that we are a people that in order to execute many of the great things that have occurred in our history, be it you know, on the on the motherland continent to to hear some type of standards had to be adhered to to implement um, any type of strategic you know campaign or effort to secure our rights. Like these were not lackadaisical notions, but I think the intentionality behind some of those choices has been lost to the um, you know kind of dustbin of history. So, for example, people often say, "Well, there were other people that refused to um, give up their seat before Rosa." parks and you hear it usually couched in see that was respectability politics at work but I would actually look at it the other way they knew that they had a potent force through television which at that time was an emerging technology and so it wasn't that people hadn't experienced dignities before but they knew that through photography media and now television if you made someone look just so saint-like and innocent it made all the vulgarities and horrors that were bestowed upon their, you know, their head look that much more awful. And I think that strategy point has been lost because people are so um, focused on she wasn't the first. It's like, no, this was a deployment. They knew what they were doing. They ensured that this person was put into this position to, to galvanize people. And so I think that, um, you know, when we think about how we look, what we do, it's no different than what people do on social media when they curate a fake lifestyle for themselves, right? They're, those influencers might not even live in that house. This isn't even my background. Hello, we're all curating <laughs> realities right. and standards and, and, and what we want to be seen as. But I think when it comes to um, notions of fit, because that, that's a word, honestly, that people use as um, their professionalism cloak. is like, oh, Keisha didn't fit. Now, Keisha had the resume that the company would claim they want, but fit meant I don't feel like I can be comfortable showing up as who I am if it means that I have to now consider, ooh, I'm dealing with a Black person now. Mm, I'm dealing with a woman now. Oh, I'm dealing with someone from another community I'm not familiar with. I think some people are protecting themselves from having to adjust to being respectful and conscious of how they're being- wow affect others and so they throw it on you as you don't fit you're not professional because deep down inside they're insecure about the fact that they may show up in a way that is harmful and so now that becomes your problem a professionalism instead of really the professionalism problems with them yeah absolutely michael and michael tell us a little bit more about your background because we've talked about this before because you actually use this this zoom background in professional settings Yes, 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 yes. So I, I, um, I intentionally, um, uh, it, it actually started back in um, the George Floyd, the George Floyd's death. I was with a group of colleagues and we were black colleagues um, together talking and one of the colleagues, she shared this background and provided it for us. So again, it wasn't mine, um, it, it was hers. And part of, um, I've intentionally had it on because um, being in meetings, 
um, I think it's so easy, especially within the institution, right? Um, and I, again, I am, I didn't say this in the beginning because I was so excited about what you were saying. About the topic, Dr. yeah, I know. Um, Delegate Smith. <laughs> Um, so Michael Hunt, I'm the director of the UMBC McNair Scholars Program at, um, at UMBC, and uh, we help first-gen, low-income, and students from historically excluded backgrounds get into graduate school, um, ultimately to get their degree. I'm an alum of UMBC. I'm also an alum of the McNair Program, so I'm directing a program that I was once a part of, which is full circle and a beautiful thing. Um, and also my wife, I am uh, with my, along with my wife, I am a um, partner in a and Hunt um, Consulting, um, where we do this kind of work in conversations to try to change and make better the world. And so I, I'm excited about the conversation, but I wanted the, when, when it comes to the background, I really think that um, professionalism, and I think you hit it when you talked about fit, um, I think that it's, it's a, the loaded word um, it's sort of like how they've they've, they've sort of gone about um, getting rid of things because of CRT, critical race theory, and not knowing what critical race theory is. But it's a, their way of skirting around the racist aspects of our country and really dealing with it. Um, I think professionalism and how we sort of have had these conversations has built in it right, from the foundation of the word professionalism, this um, white-centered um, um, uh, understanding of our work. And here's the interesting thing, is um, something we, we, we I sort of alluded to earlier. When I think of professionalism, for me, it's like, are you able to do the job, right? Are you able to complete the task? And 90% um, of the stuff that people have issues with isn't about the completion of the task, right? Um, what does that have to be? What does that have to do with me completing the task? And so I really like to challenge folks to start to talk about what this quote unquote fit is, because again, you're determining that, but you're also not trying to create a space of belonging for all of those folks that you're sort of bringing in. It's that there's this culture to maintain. And again, it goes back to our dynamic. So I do think it, it has a racist undertone to it, but I also think that a redefining and reclaiming, and as we hit to the end, when we talk about what to do next, I have some thoughts on that, but I think it requires us to redefine it and to own that. No, no, we don't need to get rid of professionalism. We don't need to get rid of the word and redefine it. So as we talk specifically about Black people in the workplace and how we show up, right, which we know we're not a monolith, that there are many different ways that Black people show up, some of which are very interested in cultural expression. So where do professionalism and, you know, the authenticity of cultural expression intersect in the workplace? And, and um, what are some areas that, you know, might be the most uh, discussed, the most challenging for us to survive and, and feel safe to show up and um, other than dress and appearance. Any thoughts on that? Um, can I start by going back just a little bit? Something mm -hmm. I just jotted down. Um, your, your question regarding whether or not professionalism is a racist construct. I do not believe that it's an actual racist construct, but it is a tool that has perpetuated and continued and try, been used by the racist to validate their actions. Um, and so kind of forwarding to your current question, about this intersectionality of professionalism and cultural, um, tell me again the word. What, expression, cultural expression. Expression, thank you. Um, Michael, you know, I appreciate going last because I get all the great ideas from y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, Michael mentioned, you know, just this whole idea about professionalism, really like, can you get the work done, right? Um, and I believe that there is an intersectionality between professionalism and cultural expression. You can be authentically yourself, get the job done, and do it very well. I do believe in some cases there, you know, depending on the, the audience, depending on the, the medium by which you do your work or, you know, that your work is presented, may have a few constructs. That's what goes back to the definition, like, okay, if this is the company, this is the setting, there's a definition for professional looking for this particular setting, which may or may not be right. But there are specific things that, you know, there are standards. Thank you, Delegate Smith, for that. There are standards that we have. But, um, you know, I can come in in my dashiki 
and get the job done. I can come in with my hair locked and get the job done in a lot of cases a lot better where I think, again, because it's been professionalism or this idea of fitting has been used really as a tool to continue this idea of supremacy. Um, you know, that's, that's really where we have a problem, but no, we absolutely can be authentically ourselves. So, you know, I mentioned Dr. Carter and, you know, I think every pastor I've ever had has been phenomenal dressers and, you know, like all of that stuff. So I enjoy putting on a suit. I enjoy, you know, I like my good pieces. You know, I like all of those things. But what I've learned is that Lee has to show up. In my current role, um, my first few months in the position, I was so busy worried about making sure I did what everybody else wanted me to do. And eventually it hit me that I was hired because they wanted Lee. They didn't want, you know, if, you know, they didn't want, my boss didn't, wasn't looking for her. She saw something in me. And if I don't show up, I'm not gonna be around much longer. And so part of that, you know, I brought with me all of the cultural expression that I, you know, everything that I am, all of my murals, morals, excuse me, all of those things that really make me who I am is one is what won me the job, right? And so we owe it to ourselves, number one, because if we're not being ourselves, then, you know, that's a whole nother stress that we're not, we shouldn't have to deal with. But on top of that, uh, they want you. Well, let me play devil's advocate a little okay. bit. And I told you I would probably be the one to do that. Mm -hmm. So we know what we do to get the job, right? We send our representative, we, we, we conform, all those words you used about the control, we are able to be controlled. We put our best, we speak in our most proper English. We sit up straight, we straighten our hair and we do what we got to do to get the job. And then we come in there on week one with the dashiki <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, everything else that makes us authentically us. Is that okay? Is that, is that, is that, is that, did we take any ownership for that? And what right does an employer or a workplace have to define what the culture should be? You know, if I work for a doctor's office, or let's say I work in the hospital, and the expectation is that I wear scrubs, and it's, you know, maybe that's more util utilitarian because it's, a, you know, safety and all of that. Or if I work in an, you know, and the uh, expectation because everyone else there is wearing business suits or college shirts or whatever the case is, is it okay that I want to come in and be super authentic and and that if I'm not able to, that's a racist thing? Or is it that that environment wasn't built for me and there's some ownership there as well? So I'll open that up to the floor. Mm. So um, as some of you may know, back in 2020, I was a primary sponsor of the Crown Act creating respectful and open, open world for natural hair. And as you can see, I do have lots. And so, um, you know, we Maryland was the seventh state to adopt that. And I think so far we have um, a couple of dozen that have. We're still, um, you know, federal legislation is still pending, unfortunately, because of the U.S. Senate. But the reason why I bring up hair specifically is that um, unless we're talking about food service or some type of sensitive environment with chemicals where just coverage of your hair is primary, right? Keeping it off of your face. A lot of other um, kind of requirements around hair are arbitrary and are really wholly unrelated to your ability um, to do the job. So I'll give you, for example, how many people remember, you know, Abercrombie & Fitch, right? From the mall. They had a Netflix special about it a few months ago where they had a handbook of the type of people they wanted to hire. And they wanted good looking people. I think that's not too surprising. We, we tend to remember a lot of the people standing outside of Abercrombie were not the ugliest people God has ever made, right? So yeah. <laughs> they a certain type of look, very express look, okay? And their notion, and there was a picture, an example of what was not attractive. And it was a dark skinned man with locks. Mm. This is like in the documentary. So they felt comfortable saying that's not attractive. They didn't just simply say this isn't Abercrombie. They said this is not attractive, right? And so they felt like they had that license to say the way a whole group of people may look is just like their existence is unprofessional right? This is kind of outrageous to me. And so when you think about our, our country's rapidly becoming more diverse, if we are saying that whole sectors are, are, are um, what's the word, that they are valid in saying only people with straight hair can be a lawyer, a banker, or what have you, but their customers don't all look that way. I think there's even just a, a policy and money-making disconnect. Why would you want to alienate 
your your own clients by saying the way they look is somehow off out of bounds. You know what I mean? And so I think that there's a lag in certain sectors to appreciate that accepting things that are not based in a European beauty construct is, is that it's okay. You'll make more money acknowledging that all types of people exist. But I do think that depending on the region of the country you live in, we probably in this region have a bit of privilege socially where we know that there are not just employees who often look like us and express themselves similarly. There may be a middle manager or even if you're lucky, someone at that top level that shares some of that um, expression. But in some parts of our country, to Chrissy's point, maybe if that's only one of a handful of entities that provide services in that sector, could you be blocking yourself out of a job? So you're basically saying, is the bait and switch okay? How can I dismantle the white supremacy inside if I'm not inside, Chrissy? I have to get <laughs> inside to get them together. So I think that it's, it's totally appropriate. Okay. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Wow. Okay. And see, I was thinking if we're ever going to redefine professionalism and really dismantle some of these, uh, these ideologies, I believe that we have to show up at the interview as ourselves. But this idea of infiltration is also a good one. And so you've changed my mindset on that, right? Because, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you do have to do the work from the inside. But, you know, thinking as a hiring manager or thinking as someone who has to sit in the interviews and you, you know, you hire a person. I, I recently went through this. You hire a person and, um, you know, everything looks amazing. And then you get them doing the work and it's like, wait a minute, who are you? <laughs> You're not the one that showed up, you know, and, and, and this is in that particular concept. It wasn't con um, concept or in that particular idea. It was not about mostly professionalism. It was just like the ability to do the work, right? So our resumes, we hire people to write our resumes now. You know, chat GPT can write an amazing resume for you, you know, and all of these other things. But um, wow, infiltration. Yeah, Thank you. infiltration. But what about me, other things like communication uh, style and, you know, add some of that, Michael, as you uh, weigh in to other mm -hmm. things. I mean, because we're going to delve into this dress and appearance, but let's also talk about some of the other constructs. So, so uh, the, the, the reality is, um, and, and we talked about it earlier, yeah, and I think I put in the chat, which you, when you were talking about, um, and Delegate Smith, um, about the, uh, I don't know if you mentioned the civil rights movement, I can't remember. Yes, you mentioned Rosa Parks. My mind always goes there because when I'm doing this work and even my own research really looks at how strategic um, folks were within the civil rights movement. And I think part of this requires strategy. Right. You just going in to do that, Chrissy, in the way that you described it. Let's say you 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 had your black vernacular you held off during the interview and now you're coming in the first day showing it um, like you have to be aware that once you do that. Right. Um, you're going to already have a target on you. Folks are going your work can be spectacular and they're going to try to find the smallest little things. Right. And then you're going to get upset because they found the smallest little thing, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it requires, if you're gonna do that, and I love that idea of getting in the door and then shaking it up, because <laughs> that's what I do, right? Um, but what I think you got to be um, very strategic on it, you have to make sure you have allies within that place, right? And start to cultivate those kinds of relationships so that when they come for you, you're not alone. Because they're gonna come for you. Right. And I think that's the important part in this, even whether it's vernacular, how you communicate, um, like we, we see how they even treat particularly black women who might be short in conversation or, um, or something like that, like they're seen differently um, than those who, you know, are just there in community with the people. Right. And so I think it's important for you to strategize. If you want to do that, the strategy has to be at the center. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of things, right, that we can assign to being cultural nuances for Black people in particular. Like some people might say that Black people can tend to be a little bit more direct, that they may um, be more mindful of observances like 
Sunday morning or, you know, Sabbath and these other things that they may even be more prescriptive in decision making and risk taking all of these kind of things. And so in addition to dress and appearance, these things may apply to us culturally and may not fit in to the established culture. I had, just to give you a little bit of lived experience, I had someone tell me just last week, wow, um, when, when I first met you six, seven months ago, this is when I would have started my position, you were so quiet and, you know, just, um, th they didn't say this, but passive was what was implied, right? And now when I hear you speak, you're just so confident and direct and whatever. And I took that very extremely offensively. And I had to actually explain that I actually was the same person then as confident as I was now. But what, what comes to me is that the person who said it was more comfortable with quiet passive me than they were with, but I do think this is cultural, right? Like I had a, I have a very strong-minded mother and a very strong-minded grandmother. And, you know, like, we're going to be direct. We're going to say it. We're going to, you know, call a thing a thing. And that in and of itself, outside of my appearance and my hair and other things can be challenging in the workplace. But I really think it is part of culturally how I, how I show up. So what do you, what do you think about something like that? You know what, actually, I'm thinking about a lived experience um, in my in, in in my job as department lead. I remember a moment of frustration for me, where you know culture kind of came out a little bit more than I probably would. I like to keep it a little tucked away. But in this particular instance, uh, we were having a conversation about um, you know something that was happening within you know the school system, and I made a very direct statement to a, a group of individuals and you know we were talking about you know well, I feel like there's a there's a breakdown in leadership here that we need to address you know, we need to see where the problem is because if this keeps happening this particular way who's leading this individual who's leading this charge right and when I said that the individuals that were on the call took it personally and definitely got offended and wanted to speak on their you know their offense and as they're talking you know I'm, I'm getting a little bit more excited you know and 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 I found, and I said, and I quote, hit dogs holler. And they said, I'm sorry, what? I said, hit dogs holler. And he was like, oh, you know, and so I did come back and I said, you know, I realized that every, you know, collo colloquialism is not necessarily according to this current construct mm -hmm. of professionalism, right? But the, the lady who I was speaking to knew exactly what I was saying because you know we identified in that particular way but you know so our communication styles and all of those things because of this racist construct this tool the, the way that this professionalism term is being used as a racist construct or as a racist tool i think has caused us to really change our, our method of speaking you know the code switching all of these things that we do on a regular basis are, are a result of that and so um it, it, it's it's this idea of redefining i think is very important and you know i believe that you have the right people to do the work of redefining um i do believe that there are still going to be multiple definitions of professionalism but from a much more open-minded perspective mm -hmm. right now it is very eurocentric and it's very driven by those in power those with money and I will say, listen, you can put on a business suit, you can do what is expected, you know, and conform and like you, I use a whole lot of colloquial and, and like old school, like old black lady quotes. I use them all day yeah. long. And sometimes we're like, I've never heard nobody say that before, but it's like part of the fabric of, you know, how I was raised and kind of speech that we use in the household and at the family reunion and stuff. And sometimes I easily like add those into my regular vernacular or whatever. So it's it's tough. There's a number of ways where we may be being judged, challenged, and criticized by um, showing up authentically. So let's have the conversation about appearance. So we talked about showing up in a dashiki. We talk about natural hair versus um, head wraps, scarves, hats, um, wigs, extensions, um, you know, all of these things. How have, have those things challenged the concept of professionalism, is there a such thing as too far? And how do we navigate wanting and needing to show up, you know, with these things that may be part of how we present ourselves in a workplace that may not be accepting of those things? 
I'm sorry that was, my internet kicked me off for a second, so I'm glad to be back. But um, there is a professor at Drexel, um, Wendy Green, that really exposed me to her scholarship around grooming codes and how they've been used to essentially hold people back both economically and socially. And so we often understandably discuss what that has meant historically for hair, both for men and women and children. It's not just, you know, women. But um, one of the things that we often under discuss is um, the gentlemen here have facial hair. There, it wasn't that long ago that certain professional environments, facial hair of any kind for any man was generally um, just not welcome, right? Not just military, but in many office spaces. And so if you consider the, the growth patterns of black hair on the face, it could be literally a prescription from a dermatologist that you maintain a small level of of facial hair so as not to overly irritate your skin. Mm -hmm. So there have been, um, I think even in Prince George's County, there have been lawsuits with um, police officers saying, if I have to actually always be clean shaven, I can end up with an infection. So sometimes people think things are just about vanity or their preference, but some of these things also can have health implications, but because people have different hair textures and different hair realities, they may not have intended for those rules to have those kind of uneven impacts. But now that they're aware, I think we have to um, make sure that these rules that we're putting in place don't have undue burdens on, on folks. I mean, th there's um, a, a particular show on TV now that talks about the behind the scenes of Miss America. And this one black, black Miss America said, no one was prepared for a black Miss America need to have her hair done at some random town in Iowa and they're like, go to the haircuttery. I mean, just all these things where there was no one to maintain her hair. These things seem frivolous, but if she wants to uphold the brand while also maintaining her own hair, they basically didn't understand what the problem was because in their world, I can get my hair done anywhere. Why can't you, right? So I think there's just a lot of ignorance about the needs um, that we have that are not just vanity based, but also rooted in the sense that our hair to be healthy needs to be treated differently than other people's hair. It's not just a feeling or opinions, it's just a reality. And it's in these moments that um, you're sometimes reminded that you're part of a subculture because like growing up in America, I know what people are using to wash their hair and do types of things. These are products I've never bought in my life, right? But but I'm aware of what they mean for millions of Americans. Commercials. And right, you know, the Pantene Pro V. I, I know whatever is out there. But it, it's 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 um, bewildering and sometimes just totally um, an area of complete ignorance um, what the needs are. I mean, I was at a press conference about something fairly serious. It was about crime fighting efforts and, and federal support. And a pretty public person who does not look like any of us, the only thing he said to me was, did it take you eight hours to get your hair done that way? Wow. So first of all, why are you even talking to me about this at a very serious setting? But secondly, no, I'm so busy. I don't have eight hours for some <laughs> for that. Um, this took 90 minutes. God bless that the healing hands that did that. But I it, it showed me how uncomfortable he was being in the presence of someone that just showed up differently than what he was used to, that even his attempt to make small talk was painful. Was, because yeah, he just didn't know what energy. to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, howdy, how good morning. All those things work just fine um with me and I share most of you as well. Yeah, Mike, any thoughts? Well, look, I'll start off by saying that my, um, the last church I was a part of, the chair of the deacon board or the, the, the leader of the church walked out while I was preaching because I was wearing a hat. Hmm. In the pulpit. In the pulpit. I was wow, wearing... you just, just turning over. I, all I'm going to show you what I look like. like <laughs> I mean, I think y'all can see my picture. That's me there with the hat on. Oh no, we hear Like I, I, again, <laughs> I wear a hat. And um part of my there was two things in that. One, um, old school folks mentality around things. That's that's one aspect of it. But I also had to learn for myself how to navigate these things and again strategizing, right? And I don't, I won't say initially, mm -hmm. my strategy during that time was right. Cause I remember one of the deacons at the church asking me about my hat and I had to remind them that his mama was wearing a hat. Right. Uh -oh. um, and that might not be the right thing, you know, <laughs> to sort of approach that. But his mama was wearing a hat, right? His mama wears his hat every Sunday. And that was worried about my hat, right? right. Like really? Um, but part of that had to help 
me, I had to go through that to also see how when I first came on to my job, how I was still like that. Again, that hat situation happened. And now I am trying to control how my students show up at a presentation, mm. right? When they're Isn't presenting their research, hand, yeah. right? And this is what I was talking about, about continuing toxic behaviors, but not knowing because we just replicate it, right? Um, and this is just what we do. And so for me, again, that mirror, right? I had to look in the mirror and really think about, okay, what are those things that I am perpetuating um, with my students, right? That I need to rethink, right? That I need to readdress, right? For myself, it ain't even about them, right? It's about me, my stuff. And then I had to realize that me going off on them with the church folks stuff, like those folks are going, and when you mentioned the subculture, right? That's their subculture. They say they open, they ain't open, they don't, that's not what they want. And it's okay, let them do what they need to do. I'm gonna go and create my own space where all are welcomed, right? Even me with the hat, right? A space that I feel comfortable in being in. But sometimes that will require you, even yourself, to really think about, are you still perpetuating some of those things? Some of those, like I remember a student not dressed up to present at a, um, for, um, at the, at, to present a leader or something and me and um, to present the, the um, they were to, they were the ones to introduce a keynote speaker and they were dressed, what we would consider a little raggedy, right? And we're like, you know, this is a student, right? Like we, like, why is he dressed this way? But then he did a great job with the presentation. And even now he's doing a phenomenal job in the world, right? I'm seeing what he's doing, like amazing. But that mindset, we had to shift it. Um, for ourselves. And again, it was it was work that we had to do. So let's look at power structures, right? Because one of the comments in the chat says that the growth of entrepreneurship in our communities may also lessen the need for many of us to conform um, and, and be able to redefine professionalism. So you talked about finding and creating your own space. We know that's not an option for everyone. Certainly, if you're your own boss, you have a little bit more leeway. Um, but in these places where we work for other people who get to create what's right and get to define what the norm is, um, you know, there can be, I would say, harm experienced by Black professionals in those settings because we cannot function, even though we want to be authentic, as if bias doesn't exist and stereotyping doesn't exist and these other things that don't exist, um, don't exist that keep us from succeeding and being successful. So what are your thoughts about power structures in these places? Um, we aren't necessarily always people that get to decide. So what does that look like? Is it, is it a continual fight? Is it a little bit of adaptation? Um, you know, what does that look like in these places where they have norms that where we don't necessarily naturally fit? Okay. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Dr. Um, Audrey Lloyd, um, it is known to be able, like the saying is that the master tools will never dismantle the master's house. Mm. And I, I struggle with that, right? Because we, every, every twist and turn, we're in somebody's system, right? There's a system that's created and we're part of it. We're sitting at the table. We have opportunities at the table. Um, and um, um, uh, I even see like when you're going around talking about ABC, like you're you're entering to those spaces, right? It's it's there for us, right? But at what point do we realize that even this, as we're talking about professionalism, right? How it's set up, will that ever change, right? Is that the tool that's going to actually dismantle this whole system that is set? And I my thoughts are two parts with that. One. I think that um, um, we we have to at least try, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that there is there's effort in the try, but I also believe that it requires us not to don't get your hopes up type thing, right? And you start to also create other avenues and other spaces like this, right? Um, that is for us to have the conversation and maybe 
the work is that black organizations, for instance, would need to re redefine how they are holding up the, 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 the pole of professionalism, right? How they are defining it. And if we can start with our own selves, right? If we can start with our own religious communities, if we can start with um, our own structures, um, um, that would actually be a good start. And that includes our own HBCUs, right? And, and those spaces that still hold on. And, and although it's for us, by us, every time I hear from folks who are from those communities and the struggles that some of the students are having, you would really think they're at a PWI, right? Mm -hmm. in, that, in that mindset. And so I still think there's a lot of work for us to do, but it, I don't know if it's holding on to the same tools that they created or they used to create the systems in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a proud alum of two HBCUs, um, Hampton University and Howard University School of Law. And I can say that my undergrad alma mater did have a pretty strict dress code. Um, I, I didn't really understand it then. I just still don't understand it now. And also the business school um, was opposed to hair like I have now. I was not in the business program, mercifully. But to Mike's point, I felt like my undergrad was trying to ensure that you got employed, right? So the paradigm wasn't about um, starting a business or entrepreneurship. It's ensuring you got a chance to get hired. And I'll never forget, I might have been a freshman or a sophomore, and um, a, a recruiter, um, a young white man recruiting from a, for, a, for a corporation, he said to me, Canton students are the best dressed, best presented students of any campus he went to at the time. And I told him, it's like, well, anyone who didn't look good didn't make it inside to see you. So you're seeing, you're seeing all the people <laughs> us, yeah. that were allowed um, to be before you. And so, but, you know, from his standpoint, wow, like, especially if there was a priority around hiring Black people, right? It made him clearly feel comfortable saying, I am going to this place to get people that look like they fit in with whatever we're doing, you know, wherever it is. But to your point, more schools are launching centers around entrepreneurship and, you know, and just really pushing that more. And I would dare say, I know this isn't maybe what ABC would be thinking about when they're talking about professional context, but I would dare say there's a reason why there are certain young people more are more attracted to being um, street pharmacists and other things yeah. because they don't have to be a different version of themselves to make that money. There's a reason why the appeal of becoming a professional athlete, well, even though there's like a one in a million shot versus being an engineer seems more appealing is because, and you can think maybe people like Alan Iverson for this, you could be your actual same self and be successful. So I think in a weird way, when, when older people, and I, and I kind of count myself as over 40 in that group, when they're puzzled as to why um, young people um, from more depressed um, circumstances don't want the more obvious routes to success. They all require you to be different mm -hmm. in ways that are not generally authentic and might seem, but why should I have to do all that? Now I can be a whole influencer, right? So there's now a new lane where I can really get paid just to be myself. And I think for people that have had an entire paradigm shaped around how you appease the white gaze, how you um, contort yourself to be seen as fully human in certain respects, it is hard to understand that type of freedom because it seems so alien. We're in the middle a little bit, some of us, I see it, but then a part right. is also like- No, no, like, I'm scared, right? Like, I'm a little, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Maybe a little but bit, the, right? <laughs> but the one thing I wanted to leave you all with in this piece is that professionalism that we've been discussing has been largely about how the worker is being treated inside the system. But I think as we move into a conversation around entrepreneurship, that Black owner needs to also give the same energy of professionalism to the Black client and customer that they would give to the non-Black client mm. and customer. So I think there's another situation where we have dehumanized ourselves in so many different respects because of the conditioning of others dehumanizing us, that sometimes we, we're so sweet. We're, in a subtle way, we're not even recognizing the diminishment of effort or sometimes um, the lack of a smile or, you know, just the subtle differences in making people feel welcome. Sorry, my, my four-year-old's very excited about life. Apologize about that. But um, I just wanted to lift that up. No, I think that's an amazing point. And I was also, while you were talking, and I was thinking about 
how does this show up as far as comparison, right? So if you know, Mike and I go in, we both work for the company and, you know, I decide I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to conform. I'm going to do what's expected of me. I'm going to, you know, cater to the white gaze and all of this stuff. And he's showing up just a little bit more culturally present, you know, how, how do we hurt one another, right? In these settings by not standing in alignment or at least standing um, to support one another, right? Because I've been in settings where I've been compared to other black people at the company or compared, you know, why well, you, you could be a little bit more like this person or this person shows up like this and you don't. So what do we think about how we, um, how we create challenges for one another when we coexist in these environments and um, have differing thoughts? Wow, that, that right there, that is, I mean, that's a very strong point. Um, I was watching, I Instagram live a couple days ago and the conversation was about comparison. And for me, the takeaway was comparison kills, right? Um, whether it's internally or, or it's coming from outside, comparison kills. The moment we start to try to measure up or measure ourselves against someone else, when again, our authenticity and, and who we bring to whatever the, whatever the situation is, is ultimately why we're there, like we have something to bring. And when we start looking at what somebody else is doing or we try to compare ourselves, like this one is better than me in this particular area. Well, the, the best part about it, and you know, to, to borrow a scripture really quickly, you know, we talk about the body and how each part of the body has a specific purpose. The toe does not look like the pinky, the pinky finger, or the nose does not look like the ear. And so in those spaces where we are, led to these comparisons. Number one, we have to be strong enough in our own selves to be able to stand against that and then also support our brothers and sisters in that. Like, listen, I, I will never be Chrissy. I can never be Chrissy. She's amazing in her space. But guess what? Lee is amazing in his space just the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. But together, oh, wait till you get us together. You know, well, that's, so that, what that's what I'm talking it. about, that lack yeah. of alignment, right? Because right. I might be the very one to see Stephanie with the locks and be like, girl, look at her, like, you know, draw more attention to us instead Almost of just definitely. fading fading into the fabric of the organization. Don't she know what we got to do to make it here? Like, I might right. be the one that causes the, the harm for her. You know, and I was that person and I've been that person, you know, because mm. I think as growing up in the grandparents' house, I understand and Michael mentioned it it was this desire to make sure that we did well. You know, we, it's like, we want to make sure that we're presenting ourselves because we understand the world that we're up against, you know? And so walking through the airport, the slippers and the bonnets and the pajama pants and all those things is like, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, like, come oh, yeah. on y'all, come on. Like, you were you know with what? Monique, you were judging our black people. I mean, you know, you know, <laughs> pray for me here, pray for me, pray for me. But no, seriously, like, you know, because it's from a space of care and like, I want us to get it. I yeah. want us to get it. But at the same time, I was guilty of comparison mm -hmm. in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Chrissy, our, our beloved, <laughs> we call him our father, Dr. Carter, um, Dr. Nathan Carter, you know, you got to look like something. He wouldn't allow us to get off the bus. If we, we could have traveled all the way to Mississippi, from Baltimore to Mississippi straight. So we had rollers, the hair, you know, we were in our, but the moment we stepped off the bus, no matter what city we were in, whatever the venue, there was a look. I recall so vividly, there were times in which we were literally in our, in our actual attire, getting ready to perform. And he would look at the group. He wanted to see specific things. And if he didn't, if he didn't like something, he didn't mind sitting you down because he understood like, you know, we're in this particular space and we need to be able to navigate the space and it's got to look a certain way. You know, again, wrapped in care with a little bit of comparison in there, right? And so as we talk about redefining, we have to kind of make sure that we, we step away from this idea of comparison because it does kill. It kills dreams, it kills past, and it kills a whole lot of things. And there's too much brilliance and too much greatness in us to be dying because somebody else wants to look at, you know, or is comparing us to, to some, something else. So one of the questions that, oh. that came in, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, I was just gonna add to the Dr. Carter's part, portion is I think part of that too, and again, I grew up under Nathan Carter in, in that same way, right? And I think part of that though too, was that they had been in experiences where they were probably rejected because of it, right? So they are speaking from their own trauma, 
right? They're speaking from their own pain. They were speaking from their own stuff, right? That they're now putting onto the other generations or the next folks. Um, and I think that it's, we have to, what one of the things we, I've been, again, key on is that I've had to deal with my stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I'm encouraging other folks to do that same because some of that is, I like, I definitely get it. Like, I understand why they did it. But also what ends up happening is folks aren't recognizing that all of that is coming out of a space of trauma. So even when I look at, when you think about this past generation, and Stephanie is right, like we fall into this weird, at least my generation falls into this weird place of like, it makes sense because this is what we've been told all our lives. Like when I think of civil rights and even protests and movements, I always remember thinking, I know they were hot in them three piece suits and those hard bottom shoes they out there on bloody Sunday, walking across the bridge with all that, all that pomp, you know, it was a lot, right? Hats and all of that but that's what's been indoctrinated into us is like like that's that's how we show up that's how you make a difference that's how you you get to you know be important and then you have this new generation right like well well they just want to come as you are um they want to be more comfortable they don't want to challenge themselves so it's hard to kind of figure out where to land on that but a question that came in stephanie for you is do you are we finding now that there's more of a need for like legal action around discrimination for presentation for appearance and dress um, in in workplaces? Yeah. So what I um you know was mentioning to someone in that regard is that there are a lot of times people face indignities and disrespect and they chalk it up to I just gotta get out of this job or I just gotta you know get out of the situation and they never considered that they had maybe a legal cause of action, a claim, you know? I I used to be on the Community Relations Commission here in Baltimore City, which is about enforcing anti-discrimination laws. So a lot of that was employment discrimination and a lot of that employment discrimination was around race, disability, um, expression of faith, things of that nature. And so um, some things people more readily realize are not permissible and other things they might think are just unfortunate um, things, Mm -hmm. are just, you know, unfortunate. And so I think that, that's why it was important to pass the Crown Act because without a law expressly outlawing certain types of behavior, then it is just an unfortunate incident that happened to you. A lawyer can't really um, bring a claim when there's no claim to bring, right? And so when people go, well, why did you have to pass that law? I said, on one hand, it's depressing that laws like this have to be passed because it still um, it still shows that racism doesn't doesn't end, it just evolves. So um, hair has become a proxy for excluding black people. You can't say no black people. So you just go, no braids, lots and whatever. So, I mean, we have to be vigilant. And I think we forget that lawyers can only use the existing tools of law that are that exist. They can't just make it up as they go. And so there has to be, I think, a more concrete partnership between um, those who care about these issues and the civil rights um, you know, legal space, because a lot of the things are so much more obvious in our parents' and grandparents' generation. It was like, I can't go to that school. I can't use that water fountain. They were not very complicated notions of what was being um, you know, prohibited. But here, when people are hiding behind grooming codes, fit, and some of these other notions and, and hair, um, that they were able to, I think, achieve the same types of exclusion they always wanted, but they were able to stay within the color of the law. So as the um, Crown Act and similar bills get passed around the country, it takes that away. But the next step after passing those bills, the next step is ensuring that the public knows that they can do something about it. They don't just have to go, that suck that day, that's horrible, that happened to me. Now um, they know that they can bring a claim. And I think, um, there's still a gap. I mean, I passed this three years ago and people still talk to me about this all the time. And it's something that impacts men, women, children. And it's something honestly that it's still stunning that we're dealing with in a country that is this diverse at this moment in time. But as we can all see, we're in a time where being just say, what is it saying? The quiet part out loud has become um, the norm, yeah. right? Um, so we're in that season where I think we may have to revisit some of the things we're even talking about in this conversation about um, the strategies, right? Because the strategies that worked in the 60s might not be the same strategies that work now, but you also have to remember 
the same black folk we love and care for that we are trying to help through this conversation, they've all been subject to the same conditioning as I. So sometimes when they see a picture of a young person that's been unjustly um, you know, killed by the police or what have you, if the picture looks less than stellar or suggests that they're less than perfect, even their notion of extending humanity to that victim is lessened because they don't see them as virtuous or as good. And we have to check ourselves about that because I think that um, as bad as all of that is, we can't pretend we still don't live in a media age shaped by image. Images, Images are more yeah. powerful than words. Yeah, so in the comments, someone uh, contributed that we need to respect each other for where we all are. But there's also another comment that I think kind of leads me to where I land and where, where I'm learning from tonight, where a young lady mentioned that like she... It's good. She wears braids. I have braids now, but she also has some strong opinions about some other things about like maybe when a man should remove his hat. So it's kind of like that thing of, you know, we can always see what impacts us directly and then we're good as long as like our thing is, but then it's hard when you go to the next step of, for instance, I like I, I'm good with dress codes and stuff. My son goes to a, a arts and technology school and we would pull up half the kids are in pajamas some of them are wearing costumes. He tells me that's creative exp expression. They're dressed up like bananas and pencils. And, and I'm just like, what is happening, right? Like, I'm not ready. That's too far, right? So what happens, though, when we're like, good, I want crown act, but that's too far. You know, like when we, we're good with advocating for levels one, two, three, but I can't conceive level eight through nine. And maybe because those things don't impact me directly. How can we be advocates for a whole spectrum of freedom for everyone? This is tough, right? Because time and place does matter to me in some um, some you know respects. Because um, I'm trying to think about environments where this this a somber presentation just feels more appropriate. Like I guess if I was working in some type of um, sacred space, for like example, a that's home like, or... yeah, that's what I mean. Something <laughs> like I'm mean, being real, right? I yeah. don't know if the banana uniform is going to fly right? during a time of deep grief and a very, you, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel like um, the, the opposite of um, oppressive professionalism rules is it no rules. Like, I don't think, I don't think that's the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing my grandma used to say is that no matter if you're rich or poor, you can be neat and clean, right? So you might not have designer threads, but you can still be neat. Like people can't take that from you, you know? You, you know? And so I think the notion that, um, People are just basically hygienic, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that they are, um, you know, adorned in a way that keeps themselves and others safe, particularly if they're dealing with um, materials or, or, or things that could be hazardous. I just think those are the kinds of things that, that genuinely matter more so than some of the other um, superficial things. But I definitely think, for example, if I worked in a funeral home or I worked um, in a space where I needed to provide some type of um, support to people that are dealing with grief or um, even a therapist, a therapist might want to consider the type of people they're supporting. I mean, think about a therapist's office. They think about every aspect of how they're presenting to maximize comfort for those that enter their space, right? They're making a professional call that this color paint that this type of picture, that all of this will foster, um, you know, usually based on data, a level of comfort and calm for the people they seek to support. So I think that um, it, it's not the absence of rules, but it's, are they connected to you um, providing better service or showing up in a way that makes those that depend on you feel supported? And I think it's tricky because it's not black and white necessarily. It depends on the sector. It depends on the time and place. It depends on the ages of the people involved, I think sometimes too. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do, right? Where we show up in 2023 uh, as Black people in the workplace, because not everyone has the privilege or opportunity to be an entrepreneur and to be their own boss. Uh, how do we navigate you know, our authenticity, our cultural expression, our being included into workplaces that aren't necessarily designed to be inclusive? What are, what are some things and words of guidance that you would give to Black people struggling with navigating these? I like, would start off by saying, pay attention. Pay attention, like the spaces that you're entering, the, you know, who is the audience? What, you know, who is the client? Or if it's, a, if, it's perfect, if it's a workplace, what is the culture already here, right? Because there's this part that we're forgetting about that we're literally applying for this job. We're volunteering to come into this setting. So we have to be aware of what we're putting ourselves into. 
and really being able to determine whether or not this is the right fit for me or not. You know, um, it, it's crazy to go into a Fortune 500 company and they say they want shirt and tie every day. And then you get there and you want to wear a polo shirt. But you knew they wear a shirt and tie every day when you went for the interview, right? So that's also part of it. So pay attention. But in those spaces, understanding that, you know, finding those ways to be yourself. I think, you know, this image just popped in my head thinking about Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You remember when Will flipped his jacket inside out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's this compliance piece where I have on the uniform, but I'm still going, you know, I'm going I'm to flip it a little bit and make it a little bit of who I am. So, you know, I'm going to be in this space, but I still get to be me at the same time. So understand where you're going, understand who you're there for, or what, you know, what exactly is the purpose of your presence. And, and being able to navigate it. And then also, I believe one of the best things about being Black is our ability to just, to, to, to like the duality of it all, right? Like we, we have this way, whether good or bad, we've learned to be what it needs to be to be successful. Mm. You know what I mean? And so that, you know, harness that power, harness that skill, you know, whether it's the code switching in, our, in, in the way we speak or, or whatever, you know, sometimes if, if it, you know, you mentioned the spaces like, you know, the funeral home or, or the funeral or the wedding, you know, you're not going to come in in a specific type of way, you know, and so understanding what it is that you're doing. And, and it's interesting in that you mentioned that because we talked about code switching a few months ago, just to get you to continue. And the question was asked, yes, people are refusing to code switch. They're being more authentic. They're being woke at work and all of this. But are their careers advancing? And the overall consensus of that conversation was not really, like not at paces of, you know, the people who adapt and conform and play the game and all of this. So there are consequences to, not, you know, to, to deciding, to putting a stake in the ground and deciding that you need to show up differently. Any thoughts? It's funny. I, I honestly feel, I get the sense that some people say, I don't want to have to check some part of my cultural, you know, EQ at the door, right? But then I also feel protective of the culture. And so why do I even want to talk to people who don't know what I'm talking about with, with, with like, why do I want to give that to them? I remember seeing something on Twitter recently where there was a Zoom where there were two Black women um, talking, you know, at the end of the meeting, but just before the end of the meeting, someone had said, say less. And we all know what that I means. Just, right? I said that today at a meeting. That's crazy that you said that. And then that. someone got really offended because they're like, what do you mean? You don't want me to speak anymore? And right. <laughs> so there's situations where, well, maybe that use maybe using that phrase was very authentic, right? But is using it with people who don't know what you're saying, is that like to me, that's not even affirming me if you don't even know what I'm talking about, right? So I, I don't know. I feel protective of the culture. And I honestly don't find it that you know, offensive. I, I get that some people, it weighs on them to have to constantly change all the time. But I like that we have very special parts of our culture that are just like second nature to us. I, I don't, I, I pride us in the fact that we are resilient and that no matter what was taken from us, we still remix, smack it together and make some new stuff for ourselves all the time, right? And as soon as other people are using these words, I don't even want to use them anymore. So why would I speed up the process of handing over you know, these, these, uh, these beautiful nuggets of who we are. That's good. Mike? Yes, I want to add, uh, when, when um, between, it was interesting because I, uh, the, between the two of you, the word that has really resonated with me is the, the idea of to also create, right? We are creative people. We've always been, that's what Tony sort of alluded to as well. And um, uh, when I was at that point with my, the church community I was a part of, I was, I was, I had it with them. I was, I went on a Facebook rant. I was, I was just over it all. And one of my mentors reached out to me who was also a part of that community. And one phrase she said to me that has remained with me in this work, again, because this was my, my issues with them was around this aspect, right? This redefining professionalism. What does that mean for me to show up my authentic self? In many ways, they were, they were, they had um, taken away my voice in that. And what she said, she said, Michael, don't get even, create. Mm. And when she said that I didn't get it, I thought she was talking about creating a church community or something like that. But what it did was it put fire in my belly to begin to do my own work and, and especially my own self-work is what I had to create and work on. 
But then the other part was creating something that I wanted, right? That I needed. And so that's where this idea of holistic critical mentorship came from because it's my research and I was trying to figure out what to do. And if you don't mind, if y'all indulge, I just want to read the definition for you of holistic critical mentoring. And I'll also put it in the chat um, for folks. Um, and when she said it, um, another mentor said, Michael, make sure you copyright it. And so a uh, part of that creation is also protecting oneself, right? And so um, Hunt 2021, right? I want you to, because I am quoting here, right? Hunt defines HCM, Holistic Critical Mentor, as a network of inclusive reciprocal relationships between mentees and mentors that centers the voices of and values um, mentees' whole being. HCM is an ongoing process of learning from the mentee and the mentor's collective lived experience while challenging and disrupting white supremacy and racism exhibited within the white normative interpretations of professionalism. Wow. Um, and, and I have tenets around that that talks about how we're going to do this work by acknowledging race and racism, white supremacy um, um, impacts mentees, mentors, programs, and institution. Holistic critical mentor centers the voices of and, and, ex and experiences of the mentee. It supports the holistic needs of the mentees. It requires reciprocity reciprocity between the mentee mentor. Um, this includes accountabilities from all areas because I often talk about how we'll have tell the mentees to show up on time on task, but the mentors um, are an hour late, you know, for the meetings, right? And we got to catch up with them, right? Um, but mentors also, mentees invites, uh, are invited to bring their collective selves, the mentor and the mentee, their collective selves to the, the community, um, bring their culture and lived experiences to the mentoring relationship. It challenges the white normative interpretations of professionalism. It creates a network of mentoring relationships to support the mentee. And it recognizes the mentee as a budding expert within their content area. Hmm. And so those listings of the tenets of holistic critical mentoring is the work for me and the creative work to, again, do what I said earlier, is that sometimes we got to look at other tools and we got to create our tools. And also, you teach folks how to treat you right that, that I think that's something that um, um, the prophet Maya Angelou is is accredited for saying right you got to teach them how to treat you and I think part of this is creating these kinds of systems right that that really honors the full being of both the mentee the mentor the supervisor the supervisee you know the, the student the teacher the parent the child like all kinds of relationships could use this kind of model. And so I encourage us to create. So make sure that you drop your information so people can reach out to you about this program. But what this really is, is addressing and breaking down generational cycles of sharing toxicity, right? Sharing, um, you know, uh, harm and passing that down to the next generation, which I know we do, we've talked about that we do often. So this is amazing. Let's just, so um, as we wrap up, if anyone has any questions, be sure to put them in the chat or the Q&A, but we talked about understanding the workplace expectations. So making sure you understand what the expectations are, right? Because you don't wanna set yourself up to be in an environment that is not going to accept who you are and how you need to show up to feel safe, valued and comfortable. Um, this says to incorporate cultural elements thoughtfully. I think that's what Stephanie talked about a little bit, right? Like we don't have to give them everything. You know, just because just because, you know, if it's not meaningful to us, right, like just just because, but how can we incorporate our cultural expression into um, the workplace while adhering to the expectations and guidelines, but, you know, um, within that bringing ourselves bringing what we want people to know about ourselves and where we come from. Um, it talks about seeking guidance. Obviously, you can ask questions about culture, what's allowable. Um, you should be the number one advocate for inclusivity. So if you believe your workplace guidelines are restrictive and aren't inclusive, then you have to advocate for change. But that doesn't just mean change for you. If you're gonna be an advocate, you have to think about everyone um, being included and um, proposing perhaps more inclusive policies. You wanna um, educate others. And so I, I get stuck on this one. I'd like to hear what you think. Like, is it our responsibility? I, had, I was on um, a Zoom the other day and you know, I had the braids and the, a lady said to me, oh, those little ponytails and I was like oh here we go again. you know like my initial 
reaction was not to educate, but like, here we go again. Like, you know, like I, like, can we not talk about that? Right. Is it our responsibility? Does it serve us to educate others in these environments about our choices, about our culture? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I believe that part of our ability to redefine professionalism or to really dismantle some of these, you know, structures that have been put in place is education, you know, and, you know, so when the opportunity presents itself, I believe that we, we as uncomfortable as it may be, we owe it to ourselves to make sure that we are educating every chance we get because, you know, you can you can take somebody fishing. What is it? You know, you can show them, you can you can give a man a fish or eat for the day. You teach yeah. him how to fish. You know, and so the idea is that through education, we can change a mindset. We can change the mentality. We can change a culture through education. In my opinion, part of you know, in our history books, we learn about how, as an invading colony or country would come in, one of the first things they would do would remove any ideas about culture. Right? They would take away you know the nose on the sphinx yeah. or, you know, all of these things were being taken away to keep people from being educated. And so now we've got to go back and push even harder in this educational process. I was at a concert the other day and um, after the concert was over, one of my good friends, Michael, your sister, <laughs> um, was in town for this concert. And this, this elderly um, Caucasian gentleman came up and literally touched her hair like, oh, what is this? And she said, freedom. Oh, freedom. She answered. I'll she say, said, is freedom. still alive? Is his sir still uh, with us? <laughs> right. You know, I mean, but, you know, so. No, if you knew my sister. <laughs> right. That's she said, question. freedom. <laughs> freedom. And, you know, and she said it just as indignant and like right there with, like she was right there on it, you know, but in itself, it's like, okay, that's an opportunity for us to like educate. Like, first of all, don't touch that woman's hair. Secondly, you know, education. I think that we have to do it. Okay. All right. So I had to from my facial expressions, I was a little weary about that question because yeah. there's like a legal term of art about willful ignorance. Everyone's not really just purely ignorant. They're indifferent. They kind of know this might bother you. They kind of know this isn't even okay. But as long as they're in the driver's seat, they don't feel a need to have to help you. And I think that's where in the corporate space specifically, and it can be nonprofit as well, in the workspace, I think that's where Black professionals get weary is because in good faith, they are trying to educate a willfully ignorant person, which is literally a person in bad faith, having no desire to correct their behavior because they don't really care because it doesn't bother them and their bottom line. So I think that's what we have to um, root out before we um, put too much labor in is, is this an environment full to the brim with the willfully ignorant? Or are these people who simply don't know better and are open to correction and being deposited with, you know, some different, you know, information? And, so, and Stephanie, me, you're going to pay me to educate you, right? And so I, now I, I, I consult on this work. And so if you want to learn, I, I, I will send you a contract. Like we will last. Yes, let me educate you, right? So the question goes back to what Sheila um, sort of said in the chat too, because Sheila was like, if your resource, and what I've been mindful of is who is this free labor going on to, right? Um, and oftentimes it is our Black women, right? Oftentimes it's the Black folks in general, um, folks from the Native American community trying to teach us about, about, about their lived experience and stuff. Um, and, and part of it is that willful ignorance where you they really don't want to know but they want to act like they know. So what you were right on. And yet I also have been, what, what's this the girls say up in um, California, reclaiming my time, right? We, you, we, you, yeah, you're going to pay me for the time. And so I had one group who, who did me, like they, 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 I did a consulting work with them and teaching them some stuff. And I'm thinking they, I wasn't even consulting. It was one of those, like, let's talk about it, right? And this was a white national organization, right? Um, spent 30 minutes with me. And I gave them, every, like, I mean, I laid it out. And that was my first and last time ever doing that, where I recognize how people are using you for the resources that you have, especially those of us of color, right? And so I've been more mindful of that for myself, that no, you're going you to pay me for this consultation or this quote unquote teaching time. Education. 
Yes. So I, I want to wrap up by um, giving each of you the opportunity to, to, to lift something on, on one topic. So I would like you to consider if you had the opportunity to speak directly to corporations or organizations, employers, what would you say to them in this moment about professionalism and inclusion of Black people in their workplaces? And we'll start with Lee. The first thing that popped in my mind is read the room. You know, it kind of goes both ways. I talked about it as far as as the applicant, if you're going in, you know, as a corporation, as a, a, an executive, know what's happening in the world pay attention to the things that are happening you know and and find yourself being on the side of evolution <laughs> um so that would be my advice hey and mike for me it's about remembering what who has the power and it's okay for you to relinquish some of that power so that folks can rise as well. Um, I think that um, part of that, that uh, Tony mentioned, the reading of that room and that space is recognize that we're coming to you to be a part of your organization. There are things we, we, we are bringing our full selves and a lot of what we want to learn um, is there as well. But we are, if you want us to be our authentic self, then you have to provide that space for that. Um, you have to provide the resources for that. You have to allow us not to have to carry that burden of the teaching, right? We shouldn't be the one trying to teach folks about Black History Month. There should be like, put the money, bring in, bring in, pay a consultant, pay someone to do that. Don't leave that on the back of your, your only employee, your Black employee, your woman employee to talk about Women's Month or whatever. Like, let, let's go beyond that and provide us with the resources, right? So that we can truly be our authentic selves. Thank you. And Delegate Smith, you're on mute. I would say, thank you, um, Chrissy. I would say for those who um, see themselves as allies or co-conspirators in the work that we're doing, um, to not be weary and well-doing because that weekend of solidarity that may be taking you all the way out does not compare to a lifetime of warring against systems. <laughs> so gird your loins because um, we have a longer fight ahead. And for those of us, my dog is, you know, he's, he has feelings as well as you can hear. And, and for those of us who um, I feel, doggy, let me have this moment. Um, for those, those of us who feel that, um, you know, what can I do? If your job has a professional development committee, get on it so you can start steering it towards skill building and the things that matter, right? Um, if there's other kind of avenues and opportunities for you as a leader, maybe you're a mid-tier leader, senior leader, start, start creating these spaces that are focused on skill building and training and networking in a sector and not so much about these kind of, to me, primitive notions of professionalism. We, uh, at my job, we have a professional development committee, but it came out of my work as the equity officer for our agency. So the whole notion was equity work should be about professional development. It shouldn't be separated from it. So I just wanted to um, give that as a, as a strategy. That is amazing. Thank you all so very much for your contributions to this conversation. It's something that clearly uh, should be ongoing discussion in our community, also among allies that can stand for us in these workplaces. Um, I think we unpacked a lot, so much more that we could talk about, but thank you each for sacrificing your time and your expertise tonight. And thank all of you for joining ABC for our July Equity at Work. And we invite you to join us in August, where our topic will be the twice as good theory. Hmm. Thank you for Associated Black Charities. I'm Chrissy Thornton. Good night.